Uh, hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I'm actually from New York. I moved to San Francisco about four years ago. And when I left here, there actually really wasn't much of a hardware uh, ecosystem at all. So it's really encouraging to see this. I was on Wall Street. I was a trader for a long time. Uh, and then I went to O'Reilly, uh, as Matt mentioned, and uh, became a VC. And I worked at O'Reilly Alpha Tech Ventures. And I focused quite a bit on hardware. Uh, and on growing the hardware ecosystem. Um, Nick Pinkston, I don't know, do any of you guys know Nick Pinkston? Uh, plethora? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd like the notes up there if I can, just because I literally just got off a plane, sat in traffic, and just got here. Um, so, thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so Nick and I met, and we said, hey, it'd be great to kind of start up a, a hardware ecosystem. He's the founder of this company called Plethora, which is a factory of the future. So I did quite a lot with manufacturing, future manufacturing. And then I left O'Reilly in November uh, to start uh, to help start a company alongside uh, two really great founders. Uh, the company's name is Haven, and we do supply chain. So what I'm going to talk about now is basically uh, import, export, and supply chain for hardware startups. Because Matt and I were chatting, and this is an area that a lot of people really don't think about. Um, logistics is not a very exciting industry in a lot of ways. Um, it's a very old industry. And it's something that often is an afterthought. So what I'm talking about are interesting things that, uh, you know, the reason I um, started working on Haven is actually because I saw so many portfolio companies making um, very preventable mistakes repeatedly. Uh, and I would see Kickstarter projects that would be delivered late. And this is actually one of the, one of the main reasons why. So just a quick show of hands to get a sense of the audience. How many of you are actively working at a hardware startup or producing a product of some type? OK. And then another quick show of hands. How many of you are manufacturing overseas or in Mexico? OK. And have you gone through the logistics process, air freight, ocean freight? OK. OK, so it's increasingly smaller numbers. All right, so um, logistics is interesting because 90% of everything travels on a container ship. And that's a statistic that not a lot of people know. Um, it's something where if everything is going smoothly, you shouldn't be aware of how the product is getting to you. You should just order it, and then it shows up at your door. And the entire process that happens in between is often something that a, uh, a retailer buying from a wholesaler will understand, or a wholesaler importing from a distributor will understand. But it's not something that necessarily touches, um, necessarily touches you. Um, this is you know, one of the things that we work through with uh, Haven it, at Haven is how to help companies understand what the supply chain process looks like and what setting up a uh, transportation supply chain looks like. So you know, over here you have your foreign factory, you've got your widget. Um, usually you are going to truck the product from the factory and then you're going to get out of the country uh, either via air or via ocean. Uh, both will necessitate clearing customs on both sides. You clear on exit and then again on entrance. Um, if you import into a seaport, uh, there's this process demurrage where the, um, the container is stored for a while, there's warehousing, and then you can either go by truck or rail to a distribution center. And then at that point, depending on you know, perhaps your distribution center, if you're fulfilling directly, uh, you handle that piece. Or if you are outsourcing fulfillment, which we'll talk about, they handle that piece. Otherwise, you still have maybe one final step, which is to get it from your distribution center uh, to your various retailers. So there's various stages in the supply chain, kind of you know, small, medium, large. Uh, and that kind of bit on the end there is mostly a large problem. So as I mentioned, uh, both, you know, you, you're, you're clear customs on both sides. And one of the things that you have to do is declare what type of goods you have. I'm kind of walking through the, the problems here in the general process. Uh, this is the harmonized tariff schedule, HTS codes. So you can see this is a government website. Um, the degree of complexity in identifying what it is that you've just produced. So I'm not sure how many of you can read this in the back, but you know, uh, this is uh, boots. I searched for boots, I think, here. So is it waterproof footwear um, incorporating a protective metal toe cap? Does it cover the ankle but not the knee? Is it a ski boot? Does it have soles and uppers of which 90% of the external surface area is polyvinyl chloride? Well, if it does, then it has a general tariff rate of 4.6%. Rates of duty are dependent on the country, and so you can see these tiers over here. And so identifying what you've made uh, is actually an incredibly complex process, particularly if you're manufacturing something that's never been made before, which is often the case with hardware startups. 
Uh, you'll see, you know, if you have a pebble, is that a watch? Is that a computer? You know, what, is it a uh, is it a, a health-related assistive device? You know, there's so many different ways that you can screw this process up. And one of the issues with logistics as an industry is that there's not a lot of transparency. And having that opacity allows for this industry of middlemen. Uh, and customs brokers are one of those middlemen who help you navigate this process. And that's really all they do. They try to make sure that uh, your goods don't wind up in impound because they get inspected. And the customs officer decides that you've committed customs fraud by mislabeling your product. Um, there are, by the way, there are some really fantastic stories you'll hear of um, customs brokers who will say, well, if you import fabric hemmed on three sides, that's fabric, but if you hem the fourth side, it's a sheet. You know, and they walk through these like, ways that you can um, you know, evade in some ways the process, but it's a, it's a very, very sketchy industry. So this is a general overview of kind of the intermodal supply chain. Uh, containerization was started in the 1950s. Um, and it basically allows for goods to be stored at a port, managed by a crane, put onto a ship, loaded onto the chassis of a truck, uh, or transported by rail. So this is actually, a, it's a, the container is actually a remarkable, uh, remarkable invention. Um, the interesting thing is that each of these uh, areas of the intermodal process is managed and dominated by different types of companies. Um, in the U.S., we have a shortage of truck chassis, actually. There's a shortage of truck drivers and chassis. So even though this is supposed to be a nice, seamless process, it often happens that uh, large-capacity ships will unload and there won't be enough trucks to pick up the goods at the dock, and so you'll have things that will sit at port for a while. So the process isn't necessarily as seamless as you'd like to, uh, as you'd like to believe. This, again, is one area where freight forwarders, which are um, a type of... Uh, a ranger that makes sure that your goods get, you know, uh, books both the ocean and the truck, uh, and if you need it, the rail portion of it. Their job is to make sure that that uh, trend, that that handoff happens seamlessly, because it'd be very difficult for you as a small importer, in particular if you're a startup, uh, to nail each of those pieces independently. So that's kind of another layer of middleman. Um, one of the issues you hear about a lot in the U.S., particularly not so much on the East Coast, the East Coast ports are actually doing really well. The West Coast is a disaster. A lot of times I'm um, speaking to a West Coast audience, but what you need to know is that if you're importing uh, on the very, very common uh, China to L.A. trade route, uh, oftentimes, you know, for a while there were labor slowdowns that kept goods docked off the coast, not even at the port, uh, for up to two to three months. So this was a huge issue. It's particularly an issue because if you have inventory and all of your inventory is in that one shipment and all of your inventory is sitting on that ship, this is a huge, huge problem for you uh, in terms of your cash flows because all of your inventory is locked up. You can't fulfill. You have angry customers. So these are actually problems that, um, that really directly impact and, and in many ways can often kill a small business. So eventually your box makes it onto that truck or rail. It goes through. Uh, you know, your last mile problem, there's a number of uh, startups actually in the trucking space that are kind of tackling this, which uh, if anybody's interested, Haven has a blog and we, uh, we actually write stories about innovative supply chain companies, innovative people working in supply chain and try to uh, make the logistical ecosystem uh, less opaque and, you know, more well known to the startup community. So uh, what I'll touch on for the rest of the time is just the real kind of like practical considerations uh, for you as importers to help understand at each of these junctures where your likely pitfalls are. And I'll also talk a little bit about why we are doing a startup in this space because we're you know, in logistics, not in hardware, but uh, we did this because we feel there are a lot of really interesting opportunities to, to transform an industry and in doing so to transform other industries in a waterfall effect. So your number one decision is always going to be air versus ocean. And this is something that you think about and you should be planning for with your very first Kickstarter fulfillment, with your very first product run. Uh, because just show of hands, does anyone know what the difference, in is, difference is in price between air and ocean freight? Guesses? Huh? That's, that's peak. That's like when Apple is buying up air freight. <laughs> um, it's, it's usually five times. Rule of thumb is uh, the cost of air freight is about five times the cost of ocean freight. Before Chinese New Year, um, when nothing is going to get out, let's wait a second. 
uh, before a holiday rush, or if there's a situation like that port strike in, uh, in, on the West Coast, people, of course, roll to air because the ports, the, the, the steamship liners themselves will say, we're not going to sail into the port of Oakland because Oakland isn't unloading, so they'll just simply cancel the, the sailing. And so all of those people who would ordinarily be on that ship then in turn go to buy up the air freight. And so you can see just basic law of supply and demand around capacity, uh, the price of the air freight spikes. Apple releasing an iPhone, this is notorious. People try to get their goods out of China before this happens because they know that when you have high margin goods and big power players, um, that kind of short term demand spike really negatively impacts uh, you, the smaller supply chain holder. Because the reality is also, um, while you may have a contract to get a box onto a ship, uh, the shipping owner, the, the ship owner, Maersk, for example, has discretion about whether or not to roll your box. You're not guaranteed that spot. It's a little bit like an airline. Sometimes you show up to the airport and they've oversold the flight and somebody gets bumped. So the trade-off here is speed. Um, a typical trip from Hong Kong to LA on a, on a you know, running smoothly takes about three weeks um, versus air where you can have it here in a couple days. So what a lot of small startups do is they look at their shipment and they say, you know, you make a spreadsheet basically and you look at how much um, margin you have to build in to accommodate for air cost if you need it and you ship maybe 25% of your shipment via air and then the remaining 75% via ocean. And so you give your early, um, you know, your first run to your early Kickstarter backers maybe or your, you know, your first wave of fulfillment and then you, uh, that other stuff is going to take three weeks but at least 100% of your inventory isn't tied up on the ship. Um, LCL versus FCL, this is the other thing that's a really big decision for startups. Um, LCL is light container load or less than container load and FCL is full container load. Um, if you're moving air freight, they quote that in terms of pallets, but this is how intermodal shipping containers are, uh, are talked about. So. Um, when you think about the container that you see in your head, that 40-foot container is the most common one that everybody kind of pictures in their mind. There are also 20-foot containers. And so what we do at Haven a lot of the time is we talk to people and we say, like, what does your packing list look like? How many cubic meters are you moving? And if you're moving enough to fill up half of a shipping container, uh, it actually often makes more sense for you to book the entire thing. Uh, and that's because the full containers are easier to unload because the breakdown is done at the dock. And also, you're only as good as your weakest uh, paperwork, which means if a freight forwarder is consolidating your shipment with somebody else's shipment and that guy's customs papers are not in order, well, that entire thing is going to be uh, impounded or is not going to be allowed to move through. And so you run the, you know, you, you're taking a gamble and hoping that your freight forwarder is really checking and making sure that everything is, uh, is done according to, you know, to requirement. Um, I can't even tell you how often you'll hear this. This is a huge thing for, um, for people who are allowing their factory to negotiate their shipments. Uh, this happens when they have a family tie to a trucking company that they think you should use. Uh, there's some nepotism perhaps. Occasionally in foreign countries there's kickbacks. It's the reality on the, on the ground. And so when you're negotiating whether or not you want your factory to handle your shipment, uh, one of the things that you really want to get a sense of is a lot of times they'll roll the total cost, um, will be broken down and you'll see it as a per unit cost. So they'll give you the all in per unit of you know, widget, um, but you won't be able to see broken out from that what, your, what the logistics line item is. So you always want to kind of get a sense of what, what that, um, what you, you want to ask them to quote you that number so that you can then go and shop around and get a sense of how reputable their guy is. Um, the reality of it, and we'll, I'll go into it again briefly in Inco terms, is that oftentimes if you're doing a truck to a port from a factory in rural China, for example, or another uh, rural part of the world, that guy's guy is actually your best bet because he knows the local ecosystem way better than any uh, any American freight forwarder is going to be able to give you a quote. So a lot of times it makes sense to let his guy get it to the port and then you take ownership and you handle the transportation from the port um, into the U.S. We'll talk a little bit about that again in a second, but it's the, it's the exception to the I have a guy rule. Um, this is how the process works when you work with a forwarder. You are the shipper, you request the capacity. Um, your freight forwarder is a broker. And so while they provide a very valuable service, what they're doing 
is they're going and they're going to request quotes from multiple carriers. Sometimes they have uh, prearranged contracts where they already own the space and they've kind of taken that inventory risk and then they have to parcel that out um, to, their, to their customers. But if they don't, if they have to actually call around and go get it, then what they're also going to do is they know that they're going to get the lowest rate from the carrier if they can aggregate the most goods. But they're not going to pass that savings on to you. What they're going to do is you're just going to pay more margin. Because as far as you're concerned, you've never gotten any other quote. You don't know any differently. Because you're not going to see a line item breakdown. You're just going to be told, this is what it costs to get your goods here. And so you can maybe call around to a couple different forwarders. But none of them will tell you, well, uh, Marish charged me 1500 so I'm charging you 2000 And so that's where this process, oftentimes if you're new, you cannot go directly to the carrier because the carrier is simply not equipped to handle small business. The carrier will suggest that you reach out to a freight forwarder, reach out to an NBOCC. Some carriers actually have subsidiary arms that, um, that perform that function, but a lot of them don't. Uh, for a carrier to make the economics work, you have to be moving, they say, a little over 85 boxes a year. So you're already at that point, like that's what, a, what an ocean freight um, carrier thinks of as a small customer. And to give you some perspective, someone like Target is moving around 350,000 containers a year. So just to get a sense of like your one shipment, it means the world to you. It's your entire business. Uh, it's not really, it's just not on, uh, it's not on the radar of, uh, of, of direct to carrier. They don't have the bandwidth to serve you. Uh, Inco terms is what I mentioned. So this again, um, you'll see the difference in color now. <laughs> the road is red over here and gray over here. Uh, what an incoterm is, is it governs um, where the handoff of, where the ownership handoff happens. So a lot of times new importers will um, use an incoterm known as XWorks. And I don't want to get too into the weeds here, uh, but we have all of this up on our blog and we have a lot of guides for importing 101. Um, basically, the, you, know, you have to decide whether you want to take, the, take ownership um, at the factory, in which case you're going to arrange the local trucking, or you take it at the seaport, uh, in which case you're arranging the ocean transport, or you take it after it gets to the foreign warehouse, in which case you've had your local agent book your shipment all the way through the warehouse, which as you can envision means that you have just paid multiple layers of middleman fees. Um, but the flip side is that you otherwise have to do that whole chain, all of those, you know, navigate all of those various steps, and it's simply not really something that, um, that a lot of small companies are equipped to do, particularly when you have a small team, and I mean, how many of you guys have dedicated logistics people on staff? You know, zero, yeah? Yeah, like you do it yourself, like the CEO gets on the phone and calls a freight forwarder. Um, we talked a little bit about this. It's, summary, it's hard. Uh, but once you get it done once, you don't have to re, you know, as long as you're manufacturing the same product, you have your HS code, and at that point, you can tell your freight forwarder, this is the HS code I'm uh, moving. Uh, and then this, again, this could be an entire talk all on its own. Um, warehousing and fulfillment, you have to decide, you know, are you going to, we talk about this actually, like, you know, shamelessly plug the book here, actually. Haven doesn't do warehousing and fulfillment, but in the hardware startup, um, we talked to a couple of, uh, the, the book has a lot of case studies, and one, some of our case studies are with people who manage warehousing and fulfillment operations. And then we talk to other entrepreneurs and we have them walk through why they decided to do their warehousing and fulfillment a certain way. Um, basically, you have two primary choices in-house, which means you're going to handle all of that last mile stuff yourself. Maybe you're going to use like Shippo, maybe you're going to you know, work on some sort of trucking solution. Uh, but that, that last mile delivery from your warehouse to your customer, you're going to do. The alternative is uh, fully outsourced, where a third-party provider receives your inventory, and oftentimes they handle the, you can get it sent still in pallet form there, have your boxes shipped separately, and they will actually do that, um, you know, wrap it up in tissue paper. Uh, Amazon and Shipwire are the two that, that most small companies use for this, but there are also very niche um, independent providers. I think we actually do have a list of these, we just don't, we, we route them out, we don't help you warehouse. Um, so, you know, in a nutshell, unpredictable surcharges, opaque pricing. That's the, uh, that's, that's the logistics industry as it stands today. Um, so, I'll talk very briefly, because I think I'm probably like the last thing between you guys and food or beer or something. Um, this is what Haven does. So, Haven is a marketplace for connecting buyers of shipping capacity 
such as yourselves, shippers, with sellers of shipping capacity. And the reason we talk about it, we don't say shippers and carriers because sellers of capacity can be freight forwarders who have booked blocks or NVOCCs who have booked blocks or the liners themselves. So the way the economics of shipping works, um, very large ships have, uh, have a better unit cost. Um, the economics are better for the carrier company. Uh, the, there are a couple of interesting challenges there. The very, very large ones can't come to the US. They can't fit through the Panama Canal. I usually have a couple of slides on like the you know, magnificence of shipping over the years, but uh, that's also kind of up on Haven's blog and our Twitter account. We spend a lot of time uh, talking about the economics of freight. Um, those very, very large ships, though, there hasn't been a corresponding increase in demand. So even though there's interesting smaller shippers who are now moving and manufacturing in China earlier, and now that manufacturing is so dynamic and it moves around so much, and we see companies establishing an international supply chain ever earlier, um, there is no new target that has just sprung up to take those uh, you know, thousands and thousands of extra slots. So the carriers don't have the manpower to necessarily sell directly to small shippers, uh, but they do have the capacity. And so you see record low prices. You see a couple hundred dollars for a container uh, sometimes as low as, you know, sometimes under $100 between Port Paris intra-Asia, which happens a lot of the time if someone manufactures one component here, another, you know, um, Korea, China. Uh, you see record low rates into Rotterdam because Rotterdam can accommodate the big ships. And so the carrier companies themselves are reporting, uh, you know, Maersk, I think yesterday or the day before, reported um, uh, lower than, you know, they uh, changed their forecast lower than expected profit, and they're one of the few profitable companies in the industry. Uh, and so the, what Haven does is we enable capacity providers to, uh, to sell their capacity with no overhead because there's no sales channel required. And we allow capacity buyers to come in and connect with the carrier directly uh, because your contract is with the carrier directly, but the carrier didn't have to have a salesperson get on the phone with you. So, you know, something you, you probably, everybody's bought an airline ticket. Um, we, we, you know, we don't like the comparison to orbits, honestly, but it is something that can kind of help you think about the service that we offer. And when we work with smaller companies, we say instead of going to Delta.com and AmericanAirlines.com and United.com, and then you have to also envision like those, the airlines are remarkably sophisticated in pricing terms and in, you know, in terms of being able to rapidly meet demand. Uh, in the carrier world, you would wait usually a day, sometimes two days for that quote to come back to you, particularly if you're small and they don't really care. Uh, so what we try to do is uh, eliminate the middleman to the largest extent possible. Sometimes actually you'll see that the freight forwarder quote on the platform is in fact the lowest, you know, the, the, lowest, um, the lowest provider price. But the other thing that we've done is we've said, what if we allowed the capacity buyers to name their price for freight? Because if you think about, um, like, you know, Priceline back in, uh, you know, back when I was in college, so. <laughs> um, but this idea that you could name a price, you could set a target, and you could say maybe, um, you know, I have heard that my counterpart is getting approximately this rate, I'd be interested in something in that neighborhood, or uh, if I can keep my freight costs under $3,000 or under, you know, whatever it is, $30,000 sometimes, um, then I have that extra money to produce a bigger run or, you know, you can kind of work out, do the math. Um, so what we allow people to do is we allow small shippers, such as startups, to communicate directly with whatever provider has capacity, independent of their size or their business structure, um, always, you know, the most reputable providers. And we enable this transaction to happen in a much more efficient tech-mediated way um, versus the phone call, email, and fax model that currently exists. So. That's, uh, that's what we do, and that's you know, the various things that you should be keeping in mind as you set up your supply chain uh, and as you think about where you're going to manufacture and how you're going to import. And I am happy to take questions if anyone has them. We are uh, we are aware that there's interesting data opportunities in any marketplace model. I 
think there's a... Uh, like from uh, being a hardware investor to being a hardware-ish I still angel invest. I work, shameless plug again, with Gil Pinchina uh, on the Angelist Hardware Syndicate, the IoT Syndicate. We do connected devices. And um, we yeah, actually... The, the, yeah, tell me about actually how that works because that's something that people are not aware uh, of enough. Uh-huh. So we, um, so the Angelist syndicates are, uh, are does, that, does everyone here know what Angelist syndicates are in general? Or Okay, so the way it's structured is there's a team of like uh, two to three people. It's me, it's uh, Jeremy and Helen from Lemnos Labs. Um, Gil Pinchina, who's an angel investor, was a GM at eBay and a couple of other really impressive companies. Um, Gil has a number of syndicates, a lot of backers. So the backers are regular people. I actually got involved because I was a backer of one of Gil's other syndicates as an investor passively and then liked what he was doing and uh, thought there was an opportunity to do it for Internet of Things specifically. So what it lets small investors do is um, I can write a check of two to $5,000 into a deal, but the entrepreneur doesn't have to deal with a ton of small checks. The entrepreneur just gets a, you know, um, we've done, a, we participated in Sproutling's round. That was, I think, a $350,000 check. Uh, so the $350,000 check is what Sproutland gets, what's on their cap table. Uh, what, what we've done, though, is we've aggregated demand from people who want to put in as, usually as low as 2000 We see people in the you know, 10, 15 range. Uh, but it's real honest to God angel checks. And so it's just a way for angels to participate in later stage rounds, which de-risks, particularly for hardware, de-risks it a little bit. Uh, and we feel uh, opens up the opportunity to make angel investing in hardware, which is you know, on, honestly, Frankly, one of the hardest the hardest parts. Nobody wants to back a prototype stage product, um, you know, and, and that's and that's the reality. Uh, and so it just lets us get things funded a little bit earlier. I don't know if our last deal was announced, but it's a New York entrepreneur, so uh, you know, keep an eye out. I think he said he was going to blog about it, and we're uh, we were really excited to do that deal. So. And from the uh, entrepreneur's perspective, how does that work? How do you get money from that speaker? Yeah. So I'll be honest, it's a little slow. Um, and that's because it just has to go through the, this is uh, AngelList growing pains to some extent, uh, where people, they, have, they currently have a double opt-in structure where people reserve a spot in the round, but then there's kind of a second opt-in where they kind of ask them to go in there again and actually hit the debit this from my bank account or do the wire transfer. Um, so it does take, and, and, I, and I hope that the entrepreneur that we backed is honest about the process and in, in his write-up of it, because I think that that feedback is very good both for everyone in here to know. The reality is it's, it's not always as fast as getting a check from a VC. But from your perspective, um, you have access. It's, it's, a way to, it's a great way to fill out a round. Don't, in my opinion, I would not go to an Angelist syndicate to lead a round, but if I just needed some extra money to fill something out, or if I was doing a bridge maybe, or something along those lines, uh, it's a great way to get money without uh, and access um, because a lot of the time the investors who are doing it have a you know they don't live in San Francisco they don't have access to deals maybe but if you're doing a consumer product they are super gung ho they're passionate advocates and they're saying like how can I help how can I help you know we had uh, I think Gil backed um, a massage in the home company through a syndicate and you know we had a uh, a couple of um, couple of people who were in the syndicate who reached out and said, "Hey, I'd really like to promote this uh, in the following channels in my business, you know, that sort of thing." And so, uh, so you do have access to people who help you grow your business, but they're not sitting on your board. They're not um, they're not necessary. You know, each syndicate is different, so you want to read the rules carefully and know what you're getting into. But it's a great way to uh, to have access to a much larger check than you would ordinarily get by chasing down a whole bunch of angels for $10,000 checks. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, I, I am not, I, you know, it's funny, I've got an email that I haven't read yet that explains it in a little bit more detail. <laughs> I was on a plane <laughs> and I'm behind. Um, my understanding is that they will exercise discretion around what they will deploy into, that it will not just be a spray and pray type thing. I think that it changes the ecosystem. Uh, Gil has a late stage fund. I personally don't invest in it, but it exists. Um, and that writes much larger checks. That's in the tens of millions. Uh, when you have backers like that who can participate or follow on, uh, you have the potential to have an, an honest to God, you know, seed sized round um, done with no direct traditional VC involvement. 
I think it's, it's really interesting. I believe it's also primarily China, um, Chinese, yeah, yeah. And so that also, if, if that's a market that you want access to or want to open up or, uh, you know, I, I'm interested to see how hands-on they actually decide to be, so. Last question on, on, on this. I, I would say, does it make sense? I just think it's super interesting. We, we talk about crowdfunding tons of times. Yeah. We actually never talked about AngelList and it's a great, you know, source uh, of financing mm -hmm. and that's the number one problem for all hardware yeah. startups. So the last deal that we did, um, I, I don't want to say the exact amount. Um, it was under 250000 but it was, uh, you know, it was still a pretty hefty check. Um, the product was in pilot phase. So this is still not really, you know, to your point, I think that AngelList is interesting because it's really um, actually in many ways made getting an angel round harder because a lot of people who would have funded an angel round are now saying, well, if I can get into so-and-so Series A round with my $5,000 check, yes, I have a smaller ownership stake, but it's de-risked it substantially. Um, so I think that that's sort of an, an you know, kind of a um, maybe unintentional side effect. It, the nice thing about syndicates is you can go on there and you can search and you can see things that are very specifically vertically tailored to what you're doing. Uh, so we, I think, cross syndicated with another syndicate because they were also uh, in, in a space that this particular entrepreneur wanted some access to. And so we see that happen a lot. Uh, I believe in another round, the one we did with Sproutling, um, first round let it. And so there was, again, like a real honest to God lead and the entrepreneur was able to, they, that was sort of a series A. Uh, so I've seen it as small as this is still in pilot, uh, as large as um, this is a series A leading into B, uh, where it's just to some extra capital for manufacturing, some buffer there. I, I think it really runs the gamut. I'll be honest though, I think that in many ways, the accelerator model has replaced the angel round. Uh, that initial $10,000 for your prototype, that plus your friends and family, plus maybe your savings. Um, we talk about that a little bit in the book also, just understanding who to go to at what stage and where you're most likely to get capital from. So syndicates does not mean that there's an entire wealth of money looking for pre-prototype uh, startups. That's just not, it hasn't changed it like that. Um, All right, cool. On that note, thank you so much. On that downer. <laughs>